Hello everyone, thank you for joining me here for the online sermon at St Jude's. Uh, there's so much on this weekend. Uh, of course, this weekend is uh, the weekend of our famous fireworks event, uh, where we use the wonderful open space in our graveyard to gather. We're hoping that there might be four or five hundred people uh, there uh, joining us from the community to enjoy a sausage sizzle in the freezing cold uh, with, with, a, with a campfire and uh, just after dark we let off some fireworks. Uh, it's always a great evening. Uh, I hope that you can be there. And then on Sunday, well, it is, it's Pentecost Sunday, uh, hence the red and the uh, church colours. And uh, we have a special uh, thing that we're doing and that we'll be hearing from, uh, we'll be hearing about uh, the work of Nungalinya College, the training college for Indigenous ministry in the Northern Territory. Um, and uh, we'll be having a chance to give to the work of Nungalinya. So uh, that, uh, among many other good things that's happening this weekend, there's, there's just plenty happening at St Jude's, as there always is. Right now, though, uh, let me turn and read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. If any of you has a dispute with another, do you dare take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people? Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, do you ask for a ruling from those whose way of life is scorned in the church? I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? But instead, one brother takes another to court, and this in front of unbelievers. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers and sisters. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Well, I remember as a child hearing the idea, uh, which is, of course, broadly a Christian idea, that we go up to heaven with God when we die. And now to begin with, it's hard to visualise what that means because, well, all we've got to go on are our experiences here in this world and how could those experiences provide clues for us as to what that heavenly existence will be like? Well, as a child, perhaps I didn't have much imagination. We lived near an electricity pylon. You know those really large steel structures which carry the electricity wires high above the ground from suburb to suburb. Now, I suppose I was about four or five and, and I heard about going up to heaven with God and I pictured God as a person sitting up at the top of the electricity pylon get this with a stack of dead bodies piled up next to him well if heaven were that obviously it would not be worth changing your life to to, to attain it would it uh, thankfully uh, with some maturity and with some prayer and some Bible reading and some teaching, uh, I was able to get beyond that rather grim uh, image of what going to heaven would mean. And, and I've reached the point, that uh, you'll be pleased to know, where, where I would and have changed my life, uh, do what is different from what comes naturally in order to be in heaven with God when I die. Now in this passage, Paul wants to show the Corinthians that the kingdom of God, 
uh, which here in this context refers squarely to life after death uh, with God, it needs to be in the forefront of our mind and it needs to be the lens through which we look at the world. Uh, and it needed to be the lens particularly through which the Corinthians viewed uh, this, this problem that they were having, the presenting issue for them, uh, was lawsuits. Uh, they were, there were people in the congregation who were maintaining lawsuits against one another. Now, there is nothing wrong with bringing a lawsuit per se, but have a look at what the Corinthians have forgotten as they bring their lawsuits. Chapter 6, verse 1. If any of you has a dispute with another, do you dare take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people? Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? He's asking them to remember just who they are through the grace of God. The Lord's people, literally the saints, will judge the world. Now, hang on a minute, isn't it going to be Jesus who's to judge the world? Well, yes, but these words here in 1 Corinthians are not a mistake. The Lord's people will be involved in judging the world. Now, this is just a part of the overwhelming grace that God pours out on believers. Uh, I'm not 100% clear what it's going to look like specifically, but it fits with the fact that we are to inherit a kingdom. The sovereignty which Jesus enjoys over the world, he will share with his disciples so that we will judge the world. And in fact, even more than that, he says in verse 3 that we are to judge angels. Now, again, it's hard to know what that will look like in practice, but it, it fits with what the Bible says elsewhere about angels. The angels are God's servants. They're like the household servants of the heavenly household. But we are not the servants. The, those who, uh, have, who trust in Jesus, we are the sons and daughters. So the angels are there in some sense for us. Those who have their faith in Christ are not only forgiven for our sins, but we are elevated to a position of privilege in the heavenly household. It just boggles the mind, doesn't it? It's, it's too much. It's too much grace. And, and those truths of us being sons and daughters in God's household, well, they're just so far from the messy realities that we live with from day to day that they're easily forgotten, aren't they? I mean, when is the last time that you sat for even five minutes and just thought about the fact that as a disciple of Jesus, you are destined to judge angels? Well, evidently, it was a while since any of the Corinthian believers had sat and thought about these things. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been taking each other to court. Uh, now, I don't know for a fact what these court cases were. I'm guessing they were commercial or property disputes they had with each other. I don't think they were theological disputes necessarily. But whatever the disputes are, these Corinthian Christians are submitting them to be judged by unbelievers, by non-Christians. And that is the thing that Paul pulls them up on. See verse 8. One brother takes another to court, and this in front of unbelievers. There are just so many things wrong with the picture, aren't there? I mean, the fact that these brothers and sisters have disputes with each other that they can't resolve amicably, that's something that's wrong. The fact that they're trusting people from outside the church to judge them. It's bad witness, isn't it? It's just so bad when the church's internal disputes are aired before unbelievers. Uh, now, on this subject, I think it's telling when you see someone who is from the church trying to submit a church dispute to the court of public opinion. That is, when they go to the media. See, the court of public opinion is not shaped by the scriptures, is it? So, uh, the court of public opinion is usually going to hand down a verdict which is against the Bible-believing Christians. And I think that when people from the church, or who say they're, uh, they're from the church, when they submit the church to the court of public opinion, they're showing themselves to be very worldly Christians 
if they're Christians at all. Uh, we should not be airing our disputes uh, before unbelievers. And, and that is the first part of Paul's complaint about the lawsuits between believers. If we remember that we're to judge angels, well, we should not be submitting our disputes to unbelievers. The second part of his complaint uh, is possibly even more challenging. Verse 7 says, The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Now, it's a radical thought, isn't it? But if we don't want the church's dirty laundry to be aired in public, uh, well, I mean, if I'm in a dispute with a fellow believer, I can't control them, can I? I can't control the way they will act, but I can control myself. So if I want to do my bit to make sure that the church doesn't air its, its disputes in public, well, then maybe I need to be willing to let the other Christian wrong me rather than me fight against them. I mean, isn't that what turning the other cheek is? But it is such a radical outlook on life, isn't it? And uh, this needs more thought than, uh, than I can offer today. I just want to give a couple of examples where I don't think it applies. Uh, first of all, if Christians are having a dispute about doctrine, for example, uh, if one Christian is saying that Jesus is the Son of God, and by the way, that's the truth, uh, while another supposed Christian is saying that Jesus is not the Son of God, by the way, that's not the truth. Well, in those circumstances, that the, the Bible-believing Christians should not just roll over and say, oh, we don't want to have disputes between believers, so I won't fight them. Uh, no, as it says in the letter of Jude, we are to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. So if someone is spreading misinformation about the gospel, well, we need, patiently and gently, to fight that. Uh, we should keep on patiently stating the truth and lovingly helping people to understand why it is true. So in a dispute about doctrine, we don't turn the other cheek. Secondly, wherever there is a need for weaker people in the church to be protected from those who are strong, well then we need to speak up. Uh, for example, if you are someone who has been abused or hurt by a person that you should have been able to trust, then you need to tell somebody about that. And if you don't have anyone else that you could tell about it, then you can come and tell me and I will listen to you. Don't let anyone misuse this scripture to keep you quiet. Don't let them say, oh, well, we, we mustn't have disputes between Christians, so, so don't say anything about this. Now, that, that is a misuse of the scripture. That is not what it means. And don't let anyone misuse this scripture to silence you. Uh, but leaving those exceptions aside, assuming that you have a choice, right? You have a choice whether you are going to turn the other cheek or not. Well, then that places us in a, under the challenge of these words. If you ever were in a dispute with a fellow Christian, would you be willing, for the sake of the name of Jesus, to accept the wrong that's been done to you and not fight? Would you do that if it, if it could mean that a little less mud sticks to the name of Jesus? Well, he goes on in verse 8 to say this. Uh, instead, that is, instead of accepting the wrong done to them, instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers and sisters. The, the flow of thought is, why would you not rather be wronged? Instead, you're actually doing wrong. Now, we like to think that we'll never have to make a choice between wronging somebody else and having a wrong done to us. I mean, the whole point of a lawsuit is to do justice, isn't it? So that there's no wrong on either side. But in this fallen world that we live in, it can be very hard to find that golden mean of justice. Sometimes, in order for me not to wrong another person, I might just have to accept a wrong that's done to me. Are you willing to do that? Would you rather be wronged than to do wrong? 
that's, that's what Jesus wants us to be, isn't it? He wants us to, people, to be people who would rather suffer wrong than actually do the wrong thing to somebody else. That is the Christ-like thing. Jesus never wronged a single person. And yet in order to redeem us, he suffered the worst injustices that have ever been done since the beginning of the world. Would you rather be wronged than do wrong? I hope the answer is yes. Because as we're about to see, that is the way to inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 9 says, Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? And then he lists off a bunch of ways in verses 9 and 10 of, of types of wrongdoers. Now on the surface that sounds a bit like the old stereotype that if you do good you'll go to heaven and if you do bad then you won't. But in that case, if that, it were, if that were what it meant, well none of us would have much hope, would we? Because who could look at the list there in verses 9 and 10 and say that I've never been greedy and I've never slandered anyone and I've never committed adultery. I mean, if you take Jesus' standard of adultery in the heart, very few of us could say we're innocent of that sin. But now have a look at verse 11. Paul writes, And that is what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. All of the power that was needed to make us acceptable in the kingdom of God, and not just acceptable, to, but to make us heirs of the kingdom of God, all of that power came from Jesus and the Holy Spirit who washes us. That is what some of you were, he writes to the Corinthians. Well, they, they must have been a ragtag church. They must have had reformed thieves and swindlers in them. But I'd like you to notice especially the word justified there in verse 11. It's the same word group in the original as the word for doing wrong in verses 7, 8 and 9. So what Paul is saying is you were wrongdoers and now God has made you right. You've been made right. So if you've been washed by Jesus, then in the sight of God, there is nothing wrong with you at all. Because Jesus took all your wrongness on himself and he washed it away and made you holy. That is fully accomplished for everyone who is a disciple of Jesus. I can't express to you just how good I find this news to be. Praise God for washing and sanctifying and justifying me and everyone who trusts in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so then, coming back to verse 9, uh, when he says that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God, uh, it, this has the usual meaning that verses like this have in the New Testament. That is, if we don't repent, and if we persist in deliberately doing wrong, well then, we won't inherit the kingdom of God, because we won't have been washed. All of the sins listed in verses 9 and 10 can be forgiven. We can be washed and sanctified from all of them, and God has washed and sanctified and justified millions of people, millions and billions of times, from these sins. They can be forgiven as long as we actually turn away from those sins and ask Jesus to wash us. Forgive me, Jesus, for being greedy and help me not to be like that anymore. That is why Paul would rather the Corinthian Christians to let themselves be wronged than to do the wrong thing to other people because our wrong deeds are exactly what Jesus died to save us from. Doing wrong to each other is exactly what we're to turn away from. Now in our society at, at this time, we have a difficulty with the list of wrongs in verses 9 and 10 because we and our broader society, 
Well, we generally agree on the wrongness of all the actions listed in verses 9 and 10, except for one. Uh, that is why those words there, men who practice homosexuality, stand out to us in a way which can be very painful. Uh, this is not one of those Bible passages where it's fun to watch the preacher squirm. There's pain involved in this because we are all ordinary people who have gay friends and family who may have gay feelings or experiences ourselves and it is painful to read that homosexual practice is not pleasing to God. But these words are here in the Bible and as much as you could want them, want to avoid them, they can't be avoided. The translation is secure. They fit with the whole presentation of sexuality from Genesis to Revelation, which is that sex is a good gift of God to be enjoyed within the covenant of marriage between a man and a woman. And even though there is no mention of homosexuality in the recorded statements of Jesus, there's no doubt that Jesus agrees with these words because they are written through his Holy Spirit. So the meaning of the words here is that sex between two members of the same sex is unrighteous. So if, if we're a disciple of Jesus, then that type of sexual activity is not to be a part of our life. Well, what does that mean for a person who follows Jesus but who feels in themselves that their sexual attraction is to the same sex? Uh, well, it probably means that the, the life as Jesus' disciple will mean living as a single person. There are many people who have chosen to live this way and uh, some of them would choose to be known as celibate gay Christians. Celibate gay Christians lead fulfilling lives. And you don't have to take my word for this. Uh, if you're interested, you can listen to some of them tell their own stories at a website called livingout.org. Now, if you're someone, and I think it's probably, this is probably all of us in, in some ways, if you're someone who finds this teaching difficult to accept, well, you know, there's a whole lot of clever stuff that I could say to try to convince you. But do you, do you think that would really help? I don't think it would help. I want your faith, including your faith in this difficult word from God, I want it to rest on the cross of Christ. Jesus' blood shed for you on the cross guarantees that his word is good. You know Jesus, you know that he loves you because his, his blood shed on the cross for you, it communicates that, doesn't it? And this whole journey that we're on learning from the Bible, well, it's, it's all about God coaxing us sinners back to trusting him, isn't it? Because sin at its very root is... It's feeling that God doesn't have my best interests at heart. It's that, it's that not trusting God. It's what you could even call a, a paranoia about God, which is to say, no, I, I don't trust him. He hasn't got my best interests at heart. And, and God's word is all about coaxing us back to say, no, 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 actually you can trust him. Has he still got more coaxing to do with you? Well, if so, that's all right. But keep coming. Don't give up on listening. We can trust that the word of God is good because God is good. He can be trusted. He's proven it. Now, I started with my image of, of being a five-year-old and, and the way that I imagined going up to heaven with God. And uh, if my idea about God being up at the pylon were true, well, it, I think we can all agree it, it would not be worth changing your life in order to get into that sort of heaven. But in fact, the kingdom of God, which is to be inherited by disciples of Jesus, most certainly is worth changing your life for. Because the kingdom of God 
is life forever in God's shining presence as a member of his royal household, judging the world and angels. No wrongdoer can inherit the kingdom of God. But through Jesus, we are washed and we are made to be as if we had never done anything wrong, never, never done anything wrong whatsoever. Washed, sanctified and justified. Our task now as disciples is to live out the identity that God has given us and so not to do wrong, but to do right. And God will empower us to do that. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we are amazed that you would wash and sanctify and justify us in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for the warning here that the, the unrighteous will not inherit your kingdom. We, we mustn't persist, Father, in wrongdoing, but you want your holy people to do what is right. So please, Father, by your spirit, uh, strengthen us to do that. And Father, enable us to be empowered by this knowledge that uh, the kingdom that you have prepared for those who love you is, is beyond our imaginings. It is such grace. Uh, it is such privilege that you have poured out on those who follow Jesus. Father, please, with this great hope in our hearts, help us to persevere at following him and doing what is good. In Jesus' name, amen.